Benjamin Disraeli said of his wife, she's an excellent creature, but she never can remember which came first, the Greeks or the Romans. A Hellenic cruise is rather like that. It's a strain on the historical imagination. Greeks everywhere, but what different kinds of Greeks and how they get mixed up with Romans and Asians uh, and with their modern selves. Here's the island of Mykonos in the Aegean, for instance. Holiday resort for jaded modern Athenians. Mykonos, nothing much ever happens there. No ancient temples, no indiscreet Greek gods. It's a living place with its windmills and a tiny Byzantine church for every day of the year. But what the sea and the sun and the whitewash here achieve is good enough. After their breather at Mykonos, the ship and its 300 passengers were bound for the island of Lesbos. The ship did its voyaging by night and disgorged us each morning at another place. As an experience, it seemed almost unreal. However, here we were in Lesbos. We were within sight of the Turkish mainland, but yet here's an island that has preserved its essential Greek form almost better than any other, an island of olive groves and simple living. Three thousand years separate Homer uh, from this olive grove, but the plough's the same, and the ploughman's namesake fought at Troy. up in the mountains of Lesbos lies Ayasso. Here the local ladies most graciously entertained us and their friends with the solemn and simple dances of the countryside. There are those who like the bouncy earnestness of country dances, not least the dancers themselves.
now on towards the mainland of Turkey. There we are brought up against one of the astonishing features of Greek civilization, its tremendous reach. Why, it's found even as far away as India. Often in the West, its best preserved relic is its theater. So it seemed timely to discuss Greek drama with Professor Stanford of Dublin. What would you say, uh, Stanford, is your primary interest in the Greek drama? It's antiquity or it's essential modernity? Well, in a queer kind of way, both, I'd say. If we went and saw a performance, I think, in the theater of Dionysus in the time of Pericles, it would seem weird in many ways, completely outlandish. But yet, if we thought of the essentials behind it, I'm convinced that they are the essentials of modern drama. But of course, it was first and foremost a religious rite, wasn't it? Ah, yes. That made it, in a sense. People didn't go there tired after the day's work. They went there at a great festival of the god Dionysus, early in the morning, fresh sunlight, everyone keen and interested to they, see the religious side of they it. They began at the right end of the day. Exactly, yes. yes. And then they could get the full impact of this extraordinarily complex form of drama. You see, there was music, there was dancing, there were the elaborate rhythms, more elaborate than anything we know, and the whole impact must have been quite tremendous. But we are, in some sense, returning to that, aren't we now? Yes, I, I would agree with you there. I think many of the most so-called most modern developments of drama are really getting back to the Greek essentials of the you drama. Mean Julius Caesar played in front of a packing that case. That kind of thing. Get rid of the scenery, get rid of the furniture, get rid of the footlights, get rid of the roof if you can, and concentrate on the people and the words. Do you think we should get back to masks like those of the classical actors? Well, not entirely, though I've seen a good many mask plays, and I think they're tremendously effective in their own way, much better than any close-up of these film stars, as far as I'm concerned, I must say. As I've seen masks used by actors in the East, it has certain advantages. You know at once who the villain and the, uh, who the hero is. But of course it has obvious disadvantages. Well, it cramps. Uh, one can't have mobility of features. But I do think it gets the idea of the person rather mm -hmm. than the ego of the actor. And what we're up against is the ego of these confounded actors most of the time. Yes. I really think so. In a sense, your classical drama was uh, a, a drama of disembodied ideas. Well, it's subtler than that. It's as if the character of Agamemnon of Oedipus took possession of the person and transformed them. It's not that it becomes abstract or symbolical entirely. It's a transformation, demon possession, if you like. Yes, yes. Well, now, uh, you see we're tending more and more to approach the classical ideals and the classical techniques in even. In, in certain respects. I think so. I think one can go back to Greece, like to a pure fountain, and draw the original draught of water, and then come into the modern age again and use it here with extraordinary success. One of those draughts of water can be drawn at Miletus. In terms of sheer power, this place, Miletus, produced more colonies than any other Greek state. Its theater, shows it at once to have been one of the great bearers of Greek tradition in Asia Minor. Here, 10,000 spectators watch the classical uh, and less classical dramas of Greece and Rome. Here at Miletus, modern science was forestalled by the inspired oracles of Anaximander and Thales. Living creatures arose from the most moist element as it was evaporated by the sun. Man was like another animal, namely a fish in the beginning. So wrote Anaximander, astonishingly near the mark. And his teacher Thales even foretold an eclipse. Miletus eventually silted up and was left high and dry, a fate it shared with its neighboring rival Priene. Between them still flows the river Meander, which has enriched our language by its name as it meanders down to the receding sea. On the other side of the meander lies the erstwhile rival of Miletus, Priene. In contrast with the flamboyance of Miletus, Priene had something akin to the Anglo-Saxon spirit of understatement. Its council chamber was small. Obviously, the town council was a modest size. Its theater abstained from all grandeur, but its perfection seems almost enhanced by the passage of time. Overgrown though it is, 
the beginnings of what we now call town planning can still be seen in this austere little town. Certainly the 340 dwellings that have been excavated display the Greek house at its most characteristic, an unostentatious entrance, an inner courtyard, and small rooms around it for living and sleeping. It takes an effort of the imagination to set this carefully perfected civilization amongst the rugged fantasy of the Turkish landscape, to look at present day life and then to think back 2,500 years. North of Praini, on the way to Istanbul, we called it Pergamon. Down in the valley lies one of those splendid testimonies to the almost Edwardian extravagance of the Roman Empire the spa erected in honor of the healing god Esculapius. Here I met uh, Professor Böhringer of Berlin, the present excavator of the site, and with him drank the radioactive water of the place. These Romans had it all, down to medicinal waters and mud baths. When the disreputable emperor Caracalla got too bored with Rome, he came here to recuperate. The theatre with its stage is nearly perfect uh, and could in fact be used today. A subterranean passage led to the pump room to protect those in search of better health from the rigours of fresh air. Professor Beringer himself discovered this pump room and explained its commodious proportions with expansive enthusiasm. The Romans certainly did nothing by halves. They administered to the needs of the body with unfaltering devotion, and they knew how to keep a large place warm better than we know in Britain 2,000 years later. Temple of Healing to the Hill of Pergamon is only a short ride, and yet it's 400 years back in time from the Roman spa. This was the capital of a sturdy kingdom which held the barbarians at bay, whether from the interior of Asia Minor or from across the sea in Europe. This towering citadel, the kings of Pergamon freed Asia Minor from the invading Gauls. Upon it, they erected an altar over the ashes of their victims. But they were more than redoubtable soldiers, these Pergamenes. They were Greek in the fullest sense. Their library, now a few broken and disheveled walls, was second only to that of Alexandria. The word parchment is indeed derived from Pergamon. Out of the steep hillside, they hacked one of the most impressive theatres of classical time.
the arts of peace and war, here went hand in hand. Here is the arsenal where they stored the great stone cannonballs which they catapulted upon their foes. And these same people did immortal justice to their victims by sculpturing their dying agony in stone. For Byron's dying gladiator was in reality a dying Gaul. He leans upon his hand, his manly brow consents to death but conquers agony. Twenty-four hours later, we arrived at that symbolic bridge between Europe and Asia, Istanbul, the ancient Constantinople. Its fretted skyline of mosques obscures the historical fact that this was a Greek settlement to start with. This was Byzantium, later Constantinople, today Istanbul, founded 26 centuries ago. A Greek colony, outpost of the Roman Empire, capital of the Eastern Empire, Hellenic, then Roman, then Byzantine, but always Greek at heart, until 1453, when Islam finally triumphed. Istanbul is one of the great hinges of history. Constantinople lasted for more than a thousand years. His heart was broken not by the Turks, who are commonly accused of the crime, but by the rascally Venetian crusaders, who in the name of Christianity plundered the city 250 years before the Turk. We saw some of their loot in Venice at the beginning of the cruise. In many ways, the Turks picked up the artistic traditions of Constantinople where the Greeks had dropped them and incidentally practice a tolerance that deserves our gratitude. The center, often the trouble center, of Constantinople in its great days was the Hippodrome, where chariot races and politics were equally at home. Some of its monuments stand like petrified ghosts in the modern square, an obelisk from ancient Egypt, brought here by the Romans and set up on a carved pedestal, showing the emperor and his court. And next to it, the famous twisted bronze column brought by Constantine from Delphi in Greece, the oldest Greek monument in Istanbul. But infinitely the greatest of the Byzantine remains is Santa Sophia, that mighty church built by the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century. In the mechanics of architecture, this is one of the outstanding buildings of the world. Indeed, the whole span of Greek architecture is contained between Santa Sophia at one end and the Parthenon of Athens at the other, a thousand years. Athens marks the highest attainment of purely static and restful architecture. But here at Santa Sophia, we're in the presence of a perennial battle in brick and stone, dome fighting dome, and stability secured by the balanced opposition of forces, uh, much as in a, a Gothic cathedral. In this great church, the last of the Byzantine emperors, the 12th Constantine, received the Eucharist for the last time on the 28th of April, 1453. The following morning, the besieging Turks at last breached the splendid walls of the city. And as the Turkish Chitrone has it, with the war cries from a thousand breasts, mingled the death rattle of the countless wounded. The emperor himself 
died sword in hand. 10,000 refugees packed into Santa Sofia, where a few hours previously the priests, it is said, had been furiously debating the sex of angels. The Turks broke in, and there was such slaughter that when Mohammed the Conqueror rode into the church, his horse-trod bodies piled ten feet deep. High up on one of the pillars is proof in the shape of a human hand. It is the imprint of the hand of the Conqueror who struck the pillar and bade all bloodshed cease. Thereafter, the high altar gave place to a prayer net facing Mecca. The greatest church in Christendom had become a mosque. Istanbul is busily turning its back on history. New highways instead of twisted medieval streets. Instead of picturesque slums, new concrete houses. A little of the trimness of a Greco-Roman town is retained, though with much loss to the artist and the antiquary. When the ship was sailing west again, I discussed the significance of Constantinople with a Byzantine scholar, Michael McLagan, fellow of Trinity College, Oxford. Well, McLagan, goodbye to the domes and minarets of Constantinople. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Goodbye, alas, but I never leave the place like wanting to come back again. You know how it changes. Every time I go there, it looks different. Well, it changes, but the great thing's always the same. There are the land walls, and there is the dome of Santa Sophia. Yes, but you know, poor old Constantinople. It's always being shattered by somebody. The Christians, the Turks, and other bulldozers. And <clears throat> shabby, too, by the move of the capital to Ankara. But it, yes, but it's going ahead. These great new boulevards that are plunging through the city to the gates, they're, they're, they're really restoring the old plan. They're doing a good deal of it. Clearing away all this picturesque mess of the Middle Ages. It's a pity, these little concrete bungalows and houses going up, but it, 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 it's progress. It's a very great pity we can't do some more digging under all these places and find out something about it, because in fact I think we always forget how much Europe does owe to Constantinople. Mm -hmm. I would be prepared to go as far as to say that we should not be, there would not be, a Western Christian civilization if Constantinople hadn't held out the Saracens in 717. But just a point there, we're, we always think, or inclined to think, of Constantinople as a bulwark of European civilization against Asia, uh, as though we had to avoid Asia rather like a bad smell. But isn't there another point, too, that uh, it was really the channel between Asia and Europe? Oh, indeed it was. Yes. It was the meeting place of East and West. Its civilization was undoubtedly an amalgam partly of things that came back from Rome, and partly of things that came in new from the East. I wonder how much of Constantinople was really due to the Greek genius, and how much it owes to, to Asia. Well, I think one could say the foundation was Greek. The stability, the enormous efficiency of the administration, 800 years of an undevalued coinage, was perhaps Roman, but a great deal of the artistic side, probably, I think, the dome itself, came from somewhere further east. Is it really fair to describe Santa Sophia as the last great gift of Greek genius to the world? No, I don't think it is. To me, Santa Sophia is the first, and perhaps the greatest, monument of Byzantine architecture. I would say that Byzantine history and Byzantine art begin at this point. Well, I suppose every work of genius is substantially a fresh beginning. In that sense, by, uh, Santa Sophia is new. Oh, it's not only new, but the staggering thing is that Byzantine architecture begins, as you might say, with this terrific bang. Uh, it starts off with its finest and full-blown work, springing suddenly, like Minerva, fully fledged out of the head of Job. Another point, McLagan, naturally, on a Hellenic cruise, we tend to think in terms of Greece. But what of the Turkish contribution? Well, I don't think we can say that Europe has much debt to Turkey, but if we look at this skyline, which is now fading away from us in the background there, you will see that the beauty of the skyline of Istanbul, as we call it now, is mainly due to the Turks. Uh, apart from the great dome of Santa Sophia, this ravishing selection of minarets in different sizes and patterns is all Ottoman art. It's based upon the Greek. So ultimately, we come back to the Greeks after all. Well, I think we do, because the, the highest Turkish architecture, the work perhaps particularly of Sinan, the rather underrated but naval architect, uh, is indeed 
probably a good deal derived from Greek models, although the Turks don't care so much to think so. But his predecessor, working for the first for the conqueror, the Turkish conqueror, was after all a Greek. That links the two. That links the two. Some more copies. Greek Roman. Byzantine, Turkish, each dominion in turn has left its traces along the coast of Asia Minor. And now on our way towards the center of the Greek world, we were bound for Rhodes, a mixture of them all. Rhodes was once a commercial rival to Athens. That monstrous bronze statue, the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the world, towered by the harbor 105 feet high until it crashed in an earthquake and was ultimately loaded onto 900 camels. When at the end of the 13th century, the crusading order, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, were thrown out of the Holy Land, they captured Rhodes and held it against all comers for 200 years. Here, as later in Malta, the Knights carved their armorial bearings, built their mansions, and held on to this lonely outpost of Western Christianity. of this fortress city were long held impregnable and each section was looked after by a different nationality. This was the English section of the wall. The medieval Grand Master's Palace looks upon a Byzantine church and a Turkish mosque is but a few streets away. When one thinks that the almost unending conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean is with us still, it is useful to remind the zealous of Rhodes that there's hardly anyone on this island at least whose ancestor hasn't come here as the result of some war fought for some faith or other. Yet today there is harmony here and the leisured peace of a Mediterranean backwater. A Hellenic cruise in these waters is a history lesson for us to remember and to ponder. But for those who live here, forget if they can. <laughs>